Hey guys, BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks. Thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. So, <clears throat> if we think about it, if we take and block off the front end of this here, then somewhere in here I'm going to have to add a support because this is like 40 pounds of heat sink. Probably have to add a support here and something out in the middle because we don't want it to flex and break, break this phenolic. Well, let's see where we're at with the pole. These are two pieces of what they call skeeved heat sink. Um, made of copper. Let's check in on Facebook here this morning. Oh, shush. Shush. Quiet phone. Okay. Let's go look at Facebook this morning. Uh, let's see here. Groups. BBI amps. So I started a poll. It's a busy group. Okay. So this was 24 hours ago. Okay, here. Which would you guys like to see me build next? The brand new SB220 in the box or the ultimate Toshiba amplifier with copper heatsink? Well, the brand new Toshiba or brand new in the box SB220 got 262 votes, and the ultimate Toshiba amplifier got 163. So, okay, this is out. We'll return to you, my sweetheart. We're coming back. Now, uh, this project scares me. Really honestly scares me. Because this is one of these things that I gotta do due diligence with. I cannot shortcut corner or nothing, not that I ever do, but <clears throat> this is a once in a lifetime opportunity right here. Now we don't know what the condition of the amp is in on the inside. The paper, none of the packing, none of that stuff has been fooled with ever. So we don't know, we don't know what we're getting into inside the box, but we're gonna make the best of it. And I'm gonna do my due diligence to make this exactly correct. Um, I think if I did not due diligence on this and did not give this 160%, I think the ham community is gonna drag me out and hang me by my short hairs and not only beat me with a garden hose but probably with a wood stick so I'm ready you guys are ready everybody wants to see this so this is it this is what it would show up like when you were a young man let's say in your 15 or 20 years old and you ordered this out of the back of the amateur catalog you'd get this box and this box which is the plate transformer please note the transformer comes separately now I've got to mention that this video is uh, partially sponsored by Harbach um, and what I mean by that is I called Harbach and they were stupid cool with me on the phone. He got so excited. He's like, you got what? I'm like, yes. I've got a legit, in-package, non-assembled, still sealed SB220. He goes, well, how can I help? 
And I said, well, I know for a fact that the caps that are in that thing are going to be junk. Let's face it, you guys, the caps that are in here are 60 years old at best, 50 years old at best. We don't want to trust them to that. We just, I'm not going to trust this build to those old, old dried up caps. So I said, if you could send me a kit and not the, not, not the smaller capacitors. I want the big legit capacitor bank. I said, dude, send me some swag. So he did. So I want every electrolytic that's inside this amp, and I'd like to have a brand new one that is to today's standards. So here we are at the tail end of 2020. The tail end of 2020, and with a limited partnership with Harbach Electronics, and the kindness of the gentleman that actually had this kit that he had purchased from someplace sitting in his basement. He's got one of two of these. So I've got one of the two. Between these two gentlemen and my little bit of assemblage time and my meager attempt to pull this off, we are going to thoroughly document the very first from kit assembled SB220 on video for YouTube ever. Big shout out to Harbach. If you guys knew how much energy and effort goes into making these capacitor bank kits for you guys, um, I'll retouch on this again a couple times in the video. But uh, it's a lot of personal effort and energy for him. This is not what he does for a living. He has a full-time job just like the rest of us. But for him to put this together for all of us, and make it so that we can all consume these products is a big deal. And I want to say thanks. And thanks for kicking in and uh, one, help and support the channel and two, help and support the ham community and three, making me feel safe about putting this project together. Okay. I hate to say it, but the time has come where we've got to take everything out of the box. Well, gents, um, we're going to do this with a multi-camera view. So first off, we've got the big camera up here, eye in the sky, looking down at the workbench. We're going to use this for our layout table. Let's go over here to the other camera. We've got this set up on a table over here, and we're going to slice this thing open. We're going to start pulling parts out of it, and then we're going to lay them over on the big, on the big bench. All right, let's come on over here. First off, let me say once again, big thanks to Harbaugh. Um, for helping make this project happen. Big thanks to Mr. C. He, um, like I said, he's got a couple of these units. He thought that this would be a really fun thing for me to do. And, you know, he'd been listening to me bellyache for years about how I wanted to find one of these. And this was like some kind of really weird dream that I had that I had to get out of my system. And I want to thank him for that. He, uh, he shipped this up here and he says, here, have at it. Um, when you're done with it, sell it. I said, okay, so <clears throat> here we are. I already own an SP220, you guys. I bought one um, from Bakerman. Jeez, like 10 years ago, okay? And it's it's all hopped up. It's fully functional on all bands, but it's all hopped up. It's got, you know, a new plate transformer in it and all the, all the new spiel in it that you can get into it, but I have no desire to own this, right? <laughs> I don't. I'm doing this um, just for the pure pleasure of being able to produce it. For you guys to watch this has never been done on video before and i thought that everybody would really get enjoyment out of this video so there was a total of four boxes three that were sent from mr c one that was sent from harbach and so i called mr c and he goes well don't forget that third box and i said what third box now those of you that follow along on the bbi amps channel on facebook the little Facebook group, uh, BBI Amps. Um, you would have seen this live, the unpacking of this box and the whole story, how comical it is that I have multiples of these boxes and I've never even noticed. But what was in this box that Mr. C sent up is this right here. I don't know how rare this kit is, but I've never seen one before and I've never seen one offered for sale. 
but then in the same breath, I've never gone out and specifically done an eBay search for it. So this is part number 4968, directly from Heath Kid. And in here is the complete conversion kit for the 10 meter portion of this amp. Okay, the upgraded band switch, the longer tank coil, the upgraded chokes, all the capacitors, virginal by the way. And uh, the legit directly from the Heath Zenith company, which I did not know Heath and Zenith had merged or the same entity. But Heath kit letterhead down here on the bottom, Heath Zenith at the top, a complete parts list. And somebody manually went through and checked out that all the parts were there. And this is the official kit that they would send you to convert your SP221 to an SP220. And then also what Mr. C sent up was this. These are two badges. If you notice that the badge on the bottom, the one that's next to my thumb, which has got spray paint all over it, same thing with this thumb I was painting earlier today, apologize. Um, it's got a real doll, doll flat finish to it, and then this one is just as pretty and as virginal and as chrome as chrome can get the top one. See that? See how they're reflecting the light differently? This would be a conversion kit that they would send you way back when, don't know when. So, it's a little unclear to me if this is a 220 or a 221 that we have in the box over here. Either way, we've got all the parts to make it into a 220, which means 10 meters. Because there for a while, <laughs> the FCC was making it so that you could not commercially manufacture or produce an amplifier that would transmit above like 25 megahertz. And I think that's still kind of a rule today, but there's always a way around, there's always a way around it. There's a will, there's a way. All right, let's hop over to the little camera now. So here we are on a little camera. And Mr. C said that he opened this up to make sure that the packing was complete and that's as far as he's ever taken it. So he sealed it back up and that means we are the first people to be inside of this box, well, in a long time. Now, if you choose to buy this amplifier, you're gonna get all of this original packaging material with it too. It's going to be a lot of shipping, but it'll be worth it because you'll have all the boxes. I mean, just think about this for a minute. Come on, let me have it. You have all the boxes, all the original packaging material. This will be like literally the most legit SP220 ever to hit the market if you choose to resell it. Well, put his personal information on the inside. Let's get rid of that so it doesn't show up on camera. I feel like that scene in Pulp Fiction where they're sitting around looking inside the briefcase. with his information I'll say that much all right let's set this over here where it's not going to get damaged let's just kind of look at what we got going on here oh the metal is bright Whoa. okay SB 221 it's a 221 click over to the big camera like I said we're going to use this as our lay down table so whenever I pull anything out of the box over here, this is going to be our laydown table. We're going to lay everything in that big box over here on the table. SP221, Manuel. And this says face with a smiley face on it. I bet you that's the faceplate.
the transformer support bars. Oh, this is fun. Part number 40-1950. This is like a capacitor, a pile of capacitors. This is part number 172-6541-2, PT-203. Uh, part number 172-6545-2, PTS-303. There's our output inductor tank coil, part of our, our tank coil. Oh, the rubber is still soft. The original 110 volt power cable. The high voltage shorting bar. I cannot wait to see what is in here. Hold on, I want to take a picture of this. Sorry, you guys. Sorry. Okay. EF Johnson, I'm sure these are our tuners. More in depth with this in a minute. <laughs> seal is broken. Do not break seal. Yeah. This is to make sure that you cannot transmit above 25 megahertz right here. That will get sent on, and I'm probably going to just use a complete, completed band switch that I already have. This is part number 407-145. Oh. Play the ampere meter. <laughs> our faceplate. This is our side strips. This is our side panel. This is our backer panel, which is held on with adhesive. This is the adhesive side. This is our front side. This goes behind our capacitor bank. Two side panels, our rear panel, and the stock legit faceplate. I think now that we've got this apart, this is another faceplate he threw in. Click over to the big camera. screen side. I don't want to scratch the aluminum. Okay. This is our back plate. This is the stock SB221 face plate which stops at 15 meters. So it's got 80, 40, and 20 on it. This one's got 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. And it is in pristine 
mint condition. Let's put this away because I know my luck and I know the way I work. If I don't put this away right now, I'm going to drop it and scratch it. Jeez, Mr. C, you put your name on everything, didn't you, buddy? Whew. So the SB220 replacement faceplate was original part number 1, 203-0643-00, store part number 23. And our side plates. All right, our fan. Our rear plate that goes across the back of the amp. Piece of RG8U coax, which I'm really tempted to put 393 in it, but I'm gonna try not to. RCA cables. Miscellaneous coax, our high voltage lead, red and black, our high voltage insulation booty, wire, cover, and bag 172-6549-2, BK-WIR. sockets, fan cut out, RF pass through, RF pass through, out, in, filament pass through, filament input, um, this is the cut out for the high voltage notch, this is our pass through over here in the corner for a metering circuit and our on off switches. our internal shroud so our fan goes high volt transformer capacitor bank is all going to be on this side of the shroud this is something like that I really can't wait to get in here and see how the tubes are packaged so it was shiny aluminum Look at that. It's our top plate. Package number 69 55. Legit. They sent a baggie of solder. They did. That's awesome. Total of three bags of solder. Kester, even at that. It says Kester on the bag. Three bags of solder. Here's our rectifier board. This is our load tuner, part number 26-164, 
<sighs> Box part number 1726548-420-621. I'm sure this is going to be a doorknob. Entra Labs, North American Phillips Company. Okay, part number 63-1338. Part number 1726534, unknown. It's our standoff riser for our blocking capacitor. Op unopened. All of this stuff is unopened. Freaking love it. Part number 6-1339. This is going to be our other meter. They send us a rubber band for some reason. 407-146. Other meter. Makes sense. The plate meter is one or a 407-145. 146. That makes sense. Brown paper bag. These are screws and all our hardware. We're going to go through this later. This is parts number 172, 17, or 7115-2. PTS, uh, one of three. So that's one, that's two, that's three. Three rolls of solder. This is our housing for our capacitor bank. And now our armor. This has got to be the filament transformer. 172-6533. Uh, this is our load tuner. 26-145 I've never seen them when they're clear this is what most people pass the high voltage through these things, the asbestos wire on the filament or on the plate transformer sucks into this thing and then they get all slimy. That is just like when they made it. It's crazy. Okay, so next out of here is the well, maybe this is a filament transformer. Yeah, it's way heavy. Okay, part number 172-6540. Um, 54-238. That has got to be the filament transformer. It's the heaviest damn thing I've pulled out of here so far. Glass handle with care. Boise Cascade Corporation. Yeah. It's got to be a tube. iMac. Electron. That is our other 3500Z. Now. This is an open box. Down in here in the married of my stuff, I have another iMac box with a 3500Z in it that has not been opened. And then of course our armor, you guys. Okay. 
has not been opened. So we're just gonna deal with the cards that we were dealt, which this is an awesome deck of cards to have to play with, in my opinion. This bums me out a little bit, but I think we're gonna be just fine. Let's see what we got on the inside here. We've been dealt a good hand. Okay. Now, that's two $400 a piece tubes. Three dash 500 Z. That is everything in that box. I cannot believe I have it all sitting on my workbench. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Okay. Now, as you guys are all very aware, um, I've repaired a lot of these. So the question is, how much do I really need the book? I remember a time where I needed this book a lot. Okay. So we're going to start with the book and we're going to follow the book and we're going to do it per spec. I love paper. The copyright on this is 1978. So here we are 40 years later and we're going to start. Now, I had a guy send me a question the other day. He took a picture of an SP200. And the back of it was this, this sticker. And he wanted to know if the back of the SP200, if it had the sticker, if this made it a kit or a factory built. And because of this sticker, it makes it a kit built. This is our high voltage sticker. And this is our serial number sticker. We're going to build this as an SB220, not a 221. But serial number 07 45665 is our number. We have a piece of sandpaper, and I can only assume that this little piece of sandpaper is for cleaning the paint off the back of the faceplate around the uh, the knobs and um, the center ground post on the distribution plate on the front of the meter. I'm guessing that's what that's for. For fun, we should probably fill this out and send this in and see if it would actually go for anything. Um, this is our warranty card. Bennett Harbor, Michigan, the Heath Company. I know this is a parts department thing. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to get parts these days? Important notice, dear customer, we are in the process of changing the standard of screws from slot head, Phillips head, or from flat, uh, slot head to Phillips head. The new screws will also be back, will be black or stainless steel instead of zinc coated. If, if some of the screws in your kit do not match the description in the manual, use screws that match the size. Thread length and description is shown in the following examples. 632 by one inch. I forgot to mute my phone, I apologize. Black Phillips head screw equals 632 by one inch flat blade screw. Thank you, the Heath Company. And I think this might be a parts list. Ah, 
uh, parts require only. Be sure the following instruction. Uh, be sure to follow the instructions carefully. Use separate letter for each correspondence. Please allow 10 to 14 days for mail delivery time. Write in this space. Instructions. Please print information. Heath kit. Blah blah blah. Oh, back in a better time. All I had to do is put something in the mail. Instead, today we've fast forwarded to point, click, and pray. Okay, table of contents. Instructions. That's page number four. Uh, unpacking, page number five. Assembly notes, page number six. Parts list, page number nine. And then step-by-step -step assembly instructions start on page 13. Just general stuff here. The ALC wiring, top case assembly, under case wiring, 120, 240 volt wiring, final top case wiring, uh, cable preparation, knob installation, operations, control connect connectors and uh, meters, general tune-up, uh, periodic maintenance issues in case of difficulty. Uh, it's all on one page. Kiss it and shipping and instructions and troubleshooting chart is all on its own, page 85. Specifications, uh, circuit description, power supply, relay, RF circuit, ALC meter, meter circuits, circuit board, x-ray views, it's on page number 92, chassis photographs as reference, schematic fold-in, uh, warranty front cover, and customer service rear cover. The Heath Kit model SB221 linear amplifier is a complete self-contained uh, tabletop grounded grid linear amplifier. It is designed to operate at maximum amateur power limit on sideband CW and RTTY. The amplifier is designed to be used with to drive 100 watts. It will be used with less drive with power. And the overload output, broadband tune, input circuit for each band feeds the two iMac 3500Z triodes. Connected to grounded grid configuration, the tubes are biased beyond point of cutoff in the receive mode and the Zener regulated bias controls the idle current in the transmit mode. The tubes are cooled by a fan, similar fan. The ALC develops a negative voltage to be fed back to the exciter, aka radio to reduce its gain when the amplifier is overdriven. Yeah, that's one way to use it. Um, uh, the antenna changeover relay is normally adequate by exciter relay contacts that are placed exteriorly to the amplifier in the transmit mode. The amplifier can be operated from either 110 volts or 240 volts, 50 hertz, blah, 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 okay. An important feature of this amplifier is that it cannot be tuned up at the one kilowatt limit and then be switched to operate to sideband to two thirds kilowatt PEP input. Also switching changes both the voltages current, uh, changes both the voltage and current to the final tubes. The impedance remains the same and no additional adjustment for tuning circuits is required. What they're talking about is your tune-up uh, CW S SSB switch on the front of the SB220. All that does is change the tap, so we're going to cover that as we go further into the, into the amp. And if you tune this thing up in low, they're claiming that if you go to the higher tap, which has got a higher amount of plate volts, and it's a different complete tap in the transformer itself, um, the amperage will also increase, but there's no need to do any further tuning after you've achieved your tune, and I found that not to be the case. but. Um, the tubes are instant heat type of transmission. <clears throat> May be started as soon as the amplifier is switched on after tune up, in parentheses. What they mean by that is all 3500Z tubes are instant on. That means they're ready to go to work as soon as you turn the amplifier on. Click. If the amp is already in tune, let's say, let's just say, you turn the amplifier on, you load the, you load the amplifier up, you get it all loaded up, and then you shut it down. And you go to bed, have dinner, and skip comes in the next day, or, you know, atmospheric conditions allow you to 80 meters or whatever, whatever you had it tuned up last, it opens. You can flip the switch on and immediately get on the foot pedal. Instant on. There's no warm-up time, there's no filament, there's no indirect heating, there's none of that 
You don't have to sit there and wait for five minutes for the tubes to warm up. Turn on, go. <sighs> Your linear amplifier components are shipped in two separate cartons. The smaller carton contains the power transformer for your kit. Keep the transformer in its original carton until it is called for an assemblage step. Otherwise, what they're saying is in the instructions, leave it in the box until you're absolutely ready for it. And the reason for that is because the cabinet is so thin. Um, with, from the 220 to the 221, um, and the later models of 221, like I haven't looked that closely at this kit, um, I could look at the bottom pan. Nope, the bottom pan does not have a hole. The bottom pan in some of the older 221s had a square notch cut in the back of it where you could plug in the transformer. This has got a round hole, classic to the SB220 style of building. And you run all the leads through and you have them hard, hard soldered. The older 221s that were primarily manufacturer based amplifiers, they had a harness that ran off the bottom from a Dean's plug, a really big Dean's plug, and ran around to the front of the amplifier and you could unplug and plug the, trans, the, the, the plate transformer. And they uh, also had reinforcement bars. This amplifier has a reinforcement bars. Reinforcement bars are really important because the transformer is so heavy that when you go to ship the thing, unless it is put in, and, and we're talking today now, 42 plus years, 45, 50 years later, after original design, um, when we go to ship these things, we have to send them inside of a wood crate. So they have two inches worth of hard uh, commercial grade packing foam all the way around them, not packing peanuts and not air bladders, by the way, packing foam inside of a custom made box. And then on top of that, we have an additional two inches of hard packing foam and then a wood crate. And to help mitigate the damage, um, about 90% of the SP220s that show up here for repair, I have to go in and literally bend the floor pan back into position because the floor pan is so thin that in shipping the automated processes of shipping the thing gets banged around enough to where the transformer weight is such off-centered in the in the in the amp that it inevitably gets dropped on just its one side and then the transformer rotates it's dropped on its side so you got all your knobs and shit faced this way transformers in this back corner inevitably because all the weights in that back corner the box gets dropped on this side. The floor pan is so thin that it bends. And so when I get it on this end, every single time I've got a special piece of PTFE plastic that I use, I put down in between the transformer and the floor pan. You guys have seen me do this in many a video. And then I take that five pound shot hammer and hit it a couple times and I have to bend the plate back flat. Or we just package it properly. Any parts, okay, skipping, sorry, got off there on a tangent. Any parts or group of parts that is packaged in a bag or envelope with a part number on it should be returned to its container after you identify it and remain in the unit until actually used in a step. This will prevent intermixture of parts and add to in part identification. Some parts, however, have been placed in a bag or envelope that is not marked with an actual part number. They, they got to make it like Legos from China. I don't know if you guys have ever bought the off-brand Lego from China, which is exactly the same. When you buy Legos, everything is in a bag. Page number one is in a bag. Page number two is in a bag. Page number three is in a bag. When you buy the off-brand version from China, you get the instruction booklet. And not everything is broke out in pages. Actually, they just send you giant Ziploc bags full of the assembled par or non-assembled parts, and you have to figure out what parts go where. It just keeps the mystery alive, right? It's like Legos on a more frustrating level. But instead, in uh, uh, number, but is instead marked with a packing number that begins with the part number 171. The 171 numbers are used for packing purposes only. Do not appear in the manual or parts list. Open each bag or envelope that is marked with only a 171 packing number and identify the parts and its contents visually. I added the visually part so it made sense to you guys. Save all packing material, all parts have been located in a fertile symbol step by step. No, never use a 177 part number. If you must order replacement parts, use only the part numbers listed in the manual as parts listed 
for this purpose. Okay, so they are claiming, I can't believe I'm the first person to get to crease these pages. Let me change the white balance here real quick. Yeah, that's better. And let's zoom in here for a hot minute. They are claiming that I am going to need pliers, long needle nose pliers, diagonal cutters, wire strippers, one one eighth and one one quarter blade screwdrivers, a non-numbered, non-specific, it just says Phillips screwdriver, Heath kit soldering iron, Heath kit specific, I love that. You're gonna have to find me one of those now. And I'm sure they're out there, just haven't looked yet. Give me a minute. Or a pencil soldering iron, 25 to 40 watts. That's hilarious. So what they're saying is, I should in theory be able to assemble this entire, yeah, I never use these soldering irons. Assemble this entire thing with that 25 watt iron or this little 45 watt iron. Hmm. That's what they're claiming that we should use. There's a little tiny, tiny iron like this. Um, it's a little 25 water and this is a Weller 50 water. I don't use those for anything. Um, the assembly process for this, we will be using a Weller 100 watt, just like what's on my arm. Looks just like this. It's a 100 watt stainless steel soldering iron, or uh, stained glass window soldering iron. The 100 watt iron that they try to sell you if you do a standard eBay search, it'll look something like this. Um, it works okay. The problem with this is the plastic has a tendency to get hot and it melts away and it doesn't have the little foamy grip. And since I spend all day holding on to this thing, this has interchangeable tips in it as well. It's got a little foam handle to help insulate from the heat. And I really like the flat blade, what they call the shovel blade tip. That's what we will be using for a majority of things. Okay, other tools that might be helpful. A nut starter, and then they say it may be supplied with kit. Desoldering braid, desoldering bulb, which I've never used one of those in my life. I've always used a solder sucker. And we're over here on this page there, Luke. Always use a solder sucker and a nut driver kit. Well, we have a full nut driver kit hanging up over here on a wall which we will use full screwdriver set. Um, this myriad of parts. These are our suggested tools. We have this technology. I guarantee you that. Uh, most kits are used separately. Illustrated book contains illustrations, pictorial details. Boring, 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 boring. Boring. The next page of this book I really appreciate. This is your standard visual identification um, chart for resistors. This is your identification for its watts, how many watts it is. And then this is a simple breakdown for the color bands, four and five, uh, four and five color color bands for resistors and how they work. This is your band one digit, band two, band three, and then your multiplier, and then our tolerances. Um, I learned this from the little wheel, and I'm not going to lie to you. I have the Insta app on my phone, which is a resistor color band calculator, because I'm too lazy to remember the, the color code. Absolutely not going to lie. Never even bothered to learn it really for that much. Um, for years in my wallet, I carried around the Radio Shack three wheel resistor wheel. 
I'd be looking at stuff and I'd reach in my wallet and pull that thing out. And the other guys that were there, they'd laugh at me. You need to learn a code. And yeah, I'll get right on that. This is also, that's what this is. This is your capacitor identifier. Okay. This is a neat, neat chart. This is a neat chart. But they re are really presenting this to us as, okay, you don't know anything, but we want to get you to know. So we're going to give you this little tidbit of knowledge, and if you decide to use this little tidbit of knowledge, it's great. Or you could be like me and just be hard-headed and, you know. The next couple pages are our parts lists. We could go over that in excruciating detail. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay, so this is your FCC label. In the day, there used to be a handshake, per se, and there still is, that takes place with the FCC and the amateur community when it comes to producing its own equipment for personal use. Please note, there are no more kit amplifiers out there to buy. The FCC has put the, the kibosh to this. I get asked probably 300 times a year if I do kit amplifiers, and the answer to that question is no. Why? Because it's illegal. It is flat out against the rules. I can sell you an uncompleted component, so like minus the transistors, and then you have to install the transistors. And even at that, it can't be to where I have like switches and on off or the ability for you to power, you'd have to add all of that stuff to it. Um, kits are very hard in the sense that, um, let's say I have tried this and we're talking in hypotheticals now. Hypothetically, if we were to assemble the kit, you have the entire time of getting all the parts and having them shipped here from other places, because let's face it, none of this stuff is made where I live. Assembling them, putting together the excruciating details on how to put it together, and then even though somebody bought it from you, you usually are expected, yay, nay, even told by the customer, that you have to sit with them on the phone and explain it to them again in excruciating detail over the phone or video chat, which is a huge amount of time consumption. It's not, not to mention the fact it's illegal. So back to the handshake that used to exist, and still does, to a certain degree in the amateur community. This is a, an agreement between the, the F, SB220, or the Heathkit Corporation, and the FCC, and what the FCC has on file for Part 97, which is the rules um, that mandate to us, dictate to us amateur operators, um, what we're allowed to use, what we're allowed to use, and how much we're allowed to use of it with where, who, what, where, and hen, and how, okay? And by signing this sticker and applying it to the piece of equipment, you're now entering into an agreement with his kit and the FCC and what you have produced. It's a little mini contract. Kind of. Because if you never sign this, you gotta remember, this is a different era, when your word was gold. Okay, your word and your name meant everything to you. You're agreeing, and that you're gonna comply. No one would ever come look for this in today's day and age. I mean, we live in a day and age where you can go put anything on Facebook, Anywhere on the internet, true, false, or, and it has zero ramifications that come back to your name, your reputation, or any of that thing. It's disgusting, but it is what it is. But this is just a hark back to a different time. And a lot of amateurs would be really proud to be able to say, yes, I bought this as a kit, I've put my name on it, and I guarantee that it is completed to the best of my knowledge to match what's in the book, and the best of my knowledge to match what is out there in the world as far as rules. The FCC label right here is what it is. Okay, circuit board assembly. Like I'm skipping a page. Step-by-step -step assembly. 
Uh, da -da -da -da. Lock washers, lock nuts will be used in screws and hardware and blah 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 blah. 632 by 100 corner lock washers. And that's referred to details and proper installation in a hardware. Be sure we're following step by step. Okay. Now that we've all thoroughly read that, this is where they're going to take the time to explain to you how to solder. Which I think is wonderful. Just wonderful. They're, um, they're showing to you that they want you to... This diagram here. Let me grab a visual aid tool. Here, I'll use this little tiny diode. In this diagram, what they're showing here is how they want you to bend the resistors. I bend resistors like this. Just like that. Focus. You see how I bend that? What they're wanting us to do is bend resistors like this. Now, there's some pros and some cons to that style of bending over a resistor. Bending it over a hard edge versus bending it as a rolled over edge. In a high vibration environment, that can make a lot of difference between success and failure in the long term application. And that's what they're explaining to us here. When I used to ha work with Crown, and Harman Kardon in the car audio world, one of the things that they discovered is they built this huge amplifier. It's called the Crown A6000 GTI. Those transistors, they had a machine that was taking and pushing the legs over and bending the legs over on all the transistors in this amplifier, right? So they built like 10 test pieces and they started running them. Now, engineers are smart and they understand that people are not so smart. And so they took one of those amps and they bolted it to the back of the sub enclosure we're talking a 180 pound amplifier, <laughs> car audio amplifier, huge, right? And they bolted that thing to the back of the sub enclosure and then just sat there and let it play for like two or three days and get the snot jiggled out of it. And then it failed and they went in and they wanted to know why. And what it ended up being was, is that hard bend, the machine would put the transistor out there and then another pressure blade would come down and bend the leg of the transistors over and then get inserted into the board. That hard 90 degree bend creates a fatigue point on the outside of the wire. Okay. The vibration causes a micro fracture and eventually the leg goes plink and breaks off. Where if you do a radius bend that's nice and smooth even on the very small scale of that wire, that radius bend has a tendency to last better underneath vibration. Now, I like my edges to be nice and sharp and clean, and to me, when I go to bend something, I want to bend it this direction. So how I've overcome that is on all my tools, none of the edges are hard. Like when I bought these, I think, seven or eight years ago, I literally sat here with a file and sandpaper and filed down the edges so they're not perfectly, perfectly hard. They're radiused. So when I bend against my needle nose, it's a radius bend and not a hard 90 degree bend. That's what they're trying to get you to stay away from doing here. So, <clears throat> and then they're showing you an example of this is where it goes in the board, so on and so forth. Then they're going to explain to you the proper way to do soldering. I think most of you guys have got that. They're covering how solder bridges from sloppy solder work, like here, can be the devil in the details. Let's go on in here and look at the demonstration of this. And then we're going to quickly move away from this and we're going to go one. I'm tired of talking. I'm really, I'm tired of talking. I want to start making things. They're talking about solder splooge and a solder bridge. And this is what you're actually looking for is nice, clean joints like this. So. Well, here we are. We're at the starting point. It says start right here. It tells us all the different parts that we're going to need, how they want to have them bent, 
which direction they want to have the body parts faced. Here's the part numbers that we're going to need. Careful, inspect all diodes, blah, 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 blah. This is the way the board is going to be laid out. And the very first step that they want us to do is the high bolt rectifier doubling circuit, half of the doubling circuit. So let's go over here to our giant pile of parts and let's get this pulled. Okay. So what we have here are our primary three parts bags. Parts bag number one, two, and three. Parts bag number one, obviously, this one over here, has got our anode caps, blockers, shorting bar, two coax connectors, uh, two SO239 connectors, our breakers, and our hardware. Okay, parts bag number two, has got our high voltage bleeder circuit, has got our diodes, some more hardware, um, some more miscellaneous stuff, our, like this here, this is a disc capacitor, this is what our primary RF is going to pass through on the filament side of the circuit. Um, these are our two dissipation, and then this is going to be the one that comes off our high voltage and goes to our cabinet. This board, this bar here is where we're going to set up part of our metering circuit. <clears throat> this here is going to go underneath for the bottom of distribution and it's going to utilize this stock electrolytic, which we are not going to use. Um, the stock electrolytic I don't trust because once again, it is almost 50 years old. These are our high voltage resistors. This is also part of our high voltage circuit that goes on this board. So when we left on off on the instruction manual, we needed to go pull this board. We needed to pull these diodes. We needed to pull these resistors and these resistors here to fully assemble this out. Now I've spent a lot of time with this kit so far and some of this stuff I'm trying not to open until I'm ready to actually use it. Um, the up advantage is most of these bags, the, the glue, and I'm using this as an example. This bag here contains most of our wire. most of our wire that we're going to use and um, <clears throat> for our faceplate metering circuits and controls but most of the glue is so old that when you just flick the paper the glue breaks down and we can pop the bag right open and there's no damage to the bag. The reason I want to share that with you is because all of this stuff as I'm using it to assemble the amplifier when I'm done using it I'm putting it back into the box. When you get this, this kit, this kit amplifier, whoever ends up buying this thing, you're going to get all of this heritage with it. I, none of this holds any interest to me. But you're going to get all of, the, all of the packaging material, all the original pieces. Now, that being said, since we're now 50 years later into the story, there's a lot of things that we figured out that were done in this amplifier that we can do better today. But how far do I want to deviate from the actual real deal manufacture this to the manual versus let's do it with the cool bits in it like the one i'm really personally struggling with is the coax that they put in this kit is basically crap i mean it, it was great 50 years ago but we have way better stuff like rg393 and rg400 rg172 that kind of stuff even rg316 is superior to what's in this kit the foam dielectric um, coax that's in this kit scares me. It just scares me. Now it's held up for decades, but then I've got prime good examples of like this that I have hanging on my wall of shame that show what happens when stuff gets too hot. Yes, this came out of an SB220. Now mind you, it was heavily modified and butchered by a lot of different people and but this was the main reason the SP220 kept blowing up is because this foam has melted and the braid has gotten too close to the center conductor and there was a huge impedance bump here and it kept blowing through this, this foam dielectric. So I'm a little on the fence what I want to do as far as the coax is concerned. Um, the other thing that I'm really on the fence with is this solid core wire that's in this bag. 
I don't like it and I've never liked it. It, uh, when you attach it to the faceplate, just the movement of the faceplate as you're putting things together will cause that wire to break off. So trying to keep the color code exactly the same and the colors exactly the same, I'm going to try and replace it with PTFE wire. Okay, stuff that's stranded. So I got bags and bags and bags of this stuff. This is stranded Teflon based die markered wire that is super flexible, stupid heat resistant, and will last way longer than these wires ever could dream of lasting. And it's flexible, so therefore it's more forgiving. That's just one small example of what we got going on. Like we know for a fact, let's see, let me grab the right one here for reference. Let's go over here to bag number uh, bag number one of three. This is our anode cap. This is our aftermarket anode cap with about 10 times the amount of surface area to it. This is gonna cool the tube better than this ever could dream of. This on the other hand is something that I feel everybody can do themselves and if the guy wants to modify the amplifier with one of these, he can. I don't, to saying, there's lots and lots of aftermarket parts, but I think primarily what everybody's really interested in seeing is a two book, two spec, maybe a couple little deviations for safety reasons, like our electrolytic bank has got to be made with new modern capacitors that were made, oh, I don't know, within the last two or three years versus 50 years ago. Just saying. Um, the breakers are still something that we would use today for sure. On-off switches for sure. The doorknobs. I call it the bubble gum test. Why do we call it the bubble gum test? Because I don't know if you guys ever remember this stuff. This is called double bubble when you were kids. You used to be able to go down to the dime store they'd have a bucket of this stuff called double bubble. Remember this? Well, double bubble, I had a guy bring me this whole bucket. And this bucket is as dry as can get. This is extruded bubble gum. And when it is fresh, you can squeeze it and it collapses. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. We have found, because the capacitors, the, the, the doorknobs, the sprigs that they use in the construction of these, if they're in a southern environment, let's say like the southern states, Georgia, Florida, Arkansas, parts of Texas, you know, and even some parts of the coastal southern portions of California and so on, the humidity is really high, okay, and over the decades, the moisture has infiltrated into these, these doorknobs and we've had several of them blow up and short out. And you can always tell it's the doorknob because you pull it out and this thing is just as soft as the double bubble bubble gum. These are hard as a coffin nail so we're going to be able to stick with those and I don't need to replace them with actual um, uh, class made, ceramic made doorknobs. Um, okay, so for our kit, we need this, this, these, this. Eventually, we're going to need these and some of that. But for right now, let's just do this. So this is a little frustrating. <laughs> uh, this is really cute. So. In this bag, I found most of the high voltage parts. But then again, over in this bag, I found the 56 or 5.6K ohm resistor that I need for ground reference off the metering board. Maybe this is my guy that I'm looking for right here. The color band is right. Let me 
test and verify. And it is this. This is it. Okay. <clears throat> All the parts are here. The most common replaced part in an SB220 is a resistor that I have went through every bag in here, by the way, looking for that one resistor and it was sitting right in front of me. <sighs> it's so weird because all the parts, it, they're in all different, doesn't make any sense. The most commonly replaced resistor is this here. This is 0.8 of an ohm resistor. This is your primary ground glitch resistor. So if you have any problems with any high voltage shorting over anywhere, inside that DAG, this resistor is the weakest link in the chain. And what I mean by that is it is designed, 100% designed for failure, okay? In the entire circuit, if something goes wrong, let's put that back in its drawer, that resistor is supposed to give up its life and help protect your high voltage diodes and it pulls the ground potential away from the board, stopping the rectification process and keeping yourself from killing yourself. So like if the shorting bar makes contact and shorts out, if the amp is still plugged in and that bar makes contact, that resistor is designed to explode. It's the sacrificial lamb per se. Um, let's say that you have a problem in your tubes or your plate choke or something decides it's gonna short over. What protects your high voltage circuit? That resistor given up its life. I have dug, I dug through all of these bags. It took 45 minutes. I now know what's in every single bag, like, like this one here is the faceplate. The original SB221 faceplate. It's very meticulous in opening the bags. Very meticulous. Um, None of the bags got ripped or damaged, thank God. It just adds to the prominence of this thing. Okay, we found our one mystical unicorn part. Let's go over there. This is our sacrificial lamb. It goes right here. This is the resistor that goes here. This is the resistor that goes here. It's our string of diodes that go here. Our zener is a case-mounted zener. It attaches here. These are for your high-voltage metering circuit, these resistors here. And to dial it in specifically to the nano butt hair is this resistor here. It goes here in this corner. Um, I had to fish that out of this bag of parts here, which will be back. I know where most of these go as well. This would be a hell of a little task. If I hadn't spent the last couple of years of my adult life working with these boxes, this would be a heck of a little task to figure out what is what to goes where. Can you imagine not knowing anything about anything and buying one of these kits and deciding you're going to go teach yourself all about it? I mean, I applaud people that did this back in the day. I really do. I think it's cool. They have to sit there and then teach themselves the color band and then they're going to look through that pile of parts. Now, Matt, and this is on one of the most simplistic designed SB2. The SB220 is really one of the more simpler amplifiers there is, period. The 3500Z has all the rough, I don't care if it's Kenwood, I don't care, I, I don't care. Drake, I don't care. Um, some have power supplies external, some have full wave rectified power supplies. This one utilizes a voltage doubler. I don't care. The, the primary circuits inside of them are all exactly the same. But now imagine if you had, let's say like the, the Heathkit radios where you're talking hundreds of resistors and you didn't know anything and you decided, oh, I'm just gonna buy this kit and I'm gonna use it to teach myself. Imagine the, the wealth of knowledge you come away with out of that kit, just in identifying parts alone, puts you leagues over most people. Okay, we got our parts. Um, Let's start putting it all together. I mean, let's, I'm gonna start putting this all together and I will bring you in probably two times as I'm going and show you how we're doing in progress because I wanna get off this page and get onto another page, which, off this page, off this page, which we have to install some wires off of this, no big deal, and get onto 
page number 18 and go talk about that. And that's where we're going to cut this little segment of video off at because this can be a long process, right? Long process. And on top of this, I got to go make all of this video available to you guys. So let's get this going. We uh, got all of our sub assembly done here. Really simple. You guys have seen me rebuild these many, many times. I'm the kind of person that likes to put all of my resistors in so that all the labeling is facing up and out to where you can see it if it's written. So like here, what we did here, made it so you can read the value and see it from the front. Um, also, with our glitch resistor, I stood it up off the board. You see that? I have found through a little bit of experience that because this thing likes to burn so much that it's easier. Let me, I'm going to stand this off the board even more. It's easier to plan for the worst, pray for the best. Now we got this way off the board now. Plan for the worst, pray for the best. And it makes it easier all the way around by doing it this way, standing that one resistor up off the board. If that thing pops and blows, we have no burn mark or scorch mark for the most part on the board itself. So it allows us to do an easier repair. Now, I'm not saying I'm gonna have that happen to me, but I'm thinking for the guy down the street. The same thing comes with these little diodes. We're gonna come back to that here in the next little bit. But I'm gonna throw just the tiniest amount of flux on our joints. And then when we're done, we're gonna wash this with isopropyl alcohol to clean the flux off the board. Because I don't want there to be anything that, on, that can be left on here to be a corrosion causing anything. We're talking about multiple different old school solders, multiple different old school fluxes intermixed with stuff. We gotta be careful. We gotta be careful. So, yay, I actually get to hit solder. Two days of working on this and I finally get to hit solder. And yes, sometimes it helps to have hands that are made of asbestos. I watched this show called Fran's Lab. I think she's an amazing person. She's absolutely an amazing gal. Between her effects boards that she makes for guitarists and just smart, smart person. I enjoy her because she is single-handedly documenting the little bits of history that none of us give, most people don't give a crap about. Like, how did we make the displays work in the Apollo lander. How did we make, how did we make all of these things work? Like the latest one I watched the other day was her explaining about, and it was something I was always curious about, but I could never find any information about it. And it's one of these things that's right in front of your face, but you never bothered to think, hmm, how the hell? Um, you know, we're talking 
the 60s baby how did we have displays in mission control that were eight feet across and ten foot high that people could see in a bright and lit room because we didn't have projector technology back then you have to watch Franz Lab's ex explanation on it I was I was always curious about how that worked and how they were able to because remember <clears throat> when we see something moving across the screen today oh our brain just writes in oh they did that with digital technology we're talking 50 60 tech here there's no digital on the fly technology of anything there's no computer rendered graphics at all how did they make the little lander come off the you know the Apollo 11 let's say and then the little lander come off Eagle and they show the des descent down on the sky how did how did they do all that and it was just simple, brilliant technology. I, anyhow, I've been watching Franz Labs, and I've been watching her for a long time. And the other day, she was pointing at something, and her hand was had a little tremble in it. That's my biggest fear. But I know my day is coming. I'm screaming towards 50 every second of every minute of every day, and 60... I just thank God I'm in my early 40s and I've got my love and the dedication for the game that's called Radio. And I'm really enjoying the fact that I've been able to work myself into such a good position of being able to help and teach and possibly educate and inspire people to continue trying to build their own projects like this. It's not there yet, but I know it's coming. And my biggest fear is when I lose my hands or lose my eyesight. It just, oh my God, I adore this person. And I was like, I don't know if she was just had too much coffee in her system, but I was watching her fingers like, I was like, no, not Fran. Because she is such an awesome human being. Just awesome. The more you read about her, you find out how cool she has had a life and what she spends her time dedicated to doing for the rest of us for our use. We owe her a thanks. We do. Well, we've got our metering side of the circuit done, other portion of our metering side of our circuit done. We've got our safety resistor, glitch resistor in place. Let's go do our diodes. Let's take a minute and let's talk about our diodes here. <laughs> the easiest diode strips I've ever done in my life. They just... <clears throat> the glue is a little, a little dried out, man. Normally you got to really kind of work on these a little bit to come get them to come out of the paper a bit um, okay so there's some pros and some cons that go along with these little guys um, in my experience my my basic experience that I have here if you do anything that causes this resistor to fail or glitch resistor or sacrificial lamb per se or I'll use my pointy tool our sacrificial lamb to fail, um, it always wipes out some of these diodes or it causes them to leak horribly and we have failure from them. I'm gonna build it with these diodes, but um, what a lot of us have decided that is better and it, it, just, it just is better is that we use something like this. This is a 10A10 diode. It's a 1000 volt 10 amp diode, which is like retarded overkill for a one amp circuit but the strength of the diode is what we're playing to. Um, a lot of guys will use a six amp diode as well. Uh, six amps work great, but 10 amps is better. And like they said, but this goes to 11. But why not just mark it so it goes to 10? Yeah, but this goes to 11. It's not the same, but it is the same. Um, this is more than adequate to do the job. If you're not abusive to the piece of equipment, this diode will last forever right and believe me i've got a whole room full of them that are full of these diodes and they've lasted for decades like 20 30 years and it wasn't just until somebody decided to put it on uh, <clears throat> 10 11 meters 10 meters and then drive the poop out of it and try and get their name called on 28 or 6 or 11 or 17 or 19 or whatever and um ended up having other stuff in the box fail this pop and then these fail okay this actually works out beautifully if we take the diode and we bend it, 
like this. And some of the boards you got to drill out a little bit. But I want to show this to you in a stock configuration. I did not drill this board out at all. And if you just very carefully without having to do really any modification of the board this sits down in here just perfect the lead link is just perfect for this and then when you do your reverse diode in the opposite direction and I'm putting this out there just because I know everybody and their brother is going to watch this video I mean they are You can off stagger these pretty neatly. All the holes line up. And now this is actually stronger than anything that you're ever going to be able to electrically apply to the circuit than this here. Now, when I think of a glitch resistor in a circuit, what I'm thinking about it mentally, how I think about it and the way I look at it in my head when I visualize it, it's the same way it was taught to me by my friend Donald. Donald told me, he goes, no, 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 no. A glitch resistor can be something that fails or something that you can use to suck up the electrical pulse. When you have a hard arc to cabinet ground in your electrical circuit someplace, you want to protect your diode string, your rectification cycle, and also you want to have a calculated absorption point into the circuit a little bit, right? So how we achieve that is let's just say in the bigger amplifier that's in this room, um, I have two 800 watt 10 ohm resistors that I have in parallel. So I have 1200 watts worth of dissipation ability in these resistors, which is really high amp at like five ohms, stupid low resistance, right? And all my B plus goes through that. So if I have a problem on the anode, I'm now protecting the cathode side of the circuit, the bottom side of the tube, the part that we can't get to, and I'm also protecting my diode string. And as the short takes place, you have this huge electrical pulse that goes through the, through the circuit. Well, those resistors can absorb that energy, expand and contract like a shock absorber to that pulse. And I mean, it's, it's a violent expansion and contraction. Well, even down here on the one amp level, the only thing that we've you know, allowed for those kind of failures is our plate choke, our secondary plate choke, our little tiny plate choke, which we'll show here shortly in a little bit. And then we have the actual diode itself is part of that circuit. There's nothing on the B plus side. There's no glitch resistor. There's no other than the the ability for the current to pass through the little tiny mile and a half long worth of wire on the choke to not be make sure it's not in resonance and RF can't come back to our diode path. And then we add on top of that a disc capacitor to help throw out the reference to ground and change its resonant pathway even more. So the only thing that wants to flow through it is, well, our DC. Um, the other advantage to this, other than its absurd overkill to the circuit, is that, that the way this is spaced, there's lots of room for air to move around the diode body. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm going to build this out with the stock diodes. And one thing that has taught me in experience, and this is contrary to the manual, the manual wants you to pull these diodes down flush to the board. Um, every person that I ever talk to and I say, hey, if you're going to buy the Harbach kit, by the way, thank you Harbach for helping us make this project possible. When you put the board together, take your rectifying diodes and stand them up just about that much off the board. Like seriously, just, just stand them up just a little bit off the board and don't pull them down flush to the board. And the reason I say do that is so that you can have air move all the way around the diode body itself. And when they do blow up, you never want them to blow up, obviously, but when they do blow up, it makes it easier to change and there's less a field effect to the board, less burn mark, less, just less. 
But the main reason we do it is for cooling, to help keep the diode, because we're running right at maybe the, this is maybe like a two amp diode, right? And so, you know, your meter is an RMS meter. It's not showing you peak, your peak amp load. So when you're sitting here and looking at your plate current, that meter is an average, by the way. It's not a peak reading meter. Um, so you might be averaging one amp, but you could be pulling wildly past that in between your modulation pulses, depending on how you drive the amplifier. People are going to have fun with that last statement. Go have fun on other pieces of web pages someplace. It's the truth. You might not like it, but it's still the truth. <laughs> you can have higher peak pulses than that. Usually it's about double what your average number is, roughly 2.2, 2.5 times. Um, so you're going to have nanoseconds where it's going to pulse higher than what the actual diode can really efficiently pass through it. So why not give it the best opportunity that life can give it? And let's go ahead and present it with being stood up off the board and give it a little bit more cooling. Now what I use this little tool for, this is a tuning tool. I lay it down smooth with the board. And if you notice, smooth with the board goes all the way across half the diode path. That is my height feeler gauge. I'm going to put this together. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're using some very non-aggressive alcohol. Uh, we're using 91% isopropic and we're just lightly brushing it down. Then we come back through the paper towel and lift the flux off the board. Because remember, the flux comes through the board both directions. Um, another little parting trick, tip, whatever you want to call it. That'll do. That'll do nicely. Okay. After I get done putting in the diodes, on one of these. You got to come back and then I use flush cut, flush cut, not angle cut, but flush cut, needle nose. A lot of people use these exclusively for zip ties. And for years, all I'd used was angle cut dikes, right? Uh, flush cut. I use flush cut so I cut them really close to the board. And then I come back and I reflow all the joints again. So the whole tip of the diode is completely encapsulated in, in solder, okay? And it also eliminates a lot of the rough edges. Now, I figured this trick out, when you start building rectifier strings that are in like the 10 to 12,000 volt range, um, I had one situation where I had a step leader. A step leader is a fancy way of saying that I had an electrical arc that was coming off one of my joints and it was making a pathway through air to case ground over a substantial distance 
Um, I couldn't relocate the board, so I had to figure out why it decided that it wanted to have a, a stacked column of electrons on that one particular lead, and it, it was because of this technology, the high voltage, and the sharp point on the solder joint. And that's what was causing things to arc. And proximity was the primary thing, but I figured out that I went through and I sanded that entire string of diodes and then I went and I refloated it so all the joints were perfectly smooth and there wasn't a common high point with a sharp edge on it for the electrons to accumulate to and the problem stopped completely. That was able that allowed me to move forward and then I came back later and I put um, in between the case and that that rectifier board a big thick piece of Teflon virgin Teflon. So now the electrons have to go around the outside edge of that Teflon and then back to case ground and it basically doubled my amount of space, tripled my, more than doubled or tripled my amount of distance that the electrons have to flow. But that's it. <clears throat> this is uh, page number 16 completed. Right there. Better than the instructions in my opinion. Humble opinion. So page number 17, this is where I have to start making some decisions. This is where we're going to start adding our high voltage leads. Okay. High volt lead here. Then we're going to have our two twist together uh, orange and yellow wires and a red, uh, two blacks, and then a black stranded that comes off of here that goes to the metering board. Metering, metering, uh, metering. Then we'll have two wires that come off the back of here. One that comes from here, comes from here out of that hole specifically. And we'll use the case on the other side for the other portion of the zener. So, yeah. Look, there's going to be parts of this that I'm going to be able to move very quickly through. Very quickly through. Then there's going to be other parts where I'm going to want to stop and explain. Because we get one chance at this, you guys. I get one opportunity at this. I've accumulated a ton of knowledge about this specific amplifier. It's in my head and I've got to let it all out. That way everybody can have access to it. And as I continue to grow and doing these things, I'll, I'll have more knowledge, right? That's how it works. It's called growth. I have one chance where I can sit down and explain all the different things I've learned about just this board and seeing the failures that I'll ever have. I got one chance to be able to share all of that with you guys where everybody's going to watch. Now, everything that I've just shared with you are lessons that have been hard learned from repairs over the last decade of doing this on video. But for you to get the amount of information that you've just squeaked out of just this one video, you'd have to go and watch probably 30 or 40 other YouTube videos. So I'm sorry that I'm being this detailed and I'm not just slapping it together and hustling through it. I feel that I, I owe the radio community that debt because they've been willing to pay me to teach myself this stuff. So why not repay it back is the way I look at it. And this is my, this is my workout. You can't become laxed. The, the minute you become laxed and take things for granted in any portion of life, all of a sudden your work ethic slumps off. Your ability to the thing that made you special or unique goes away. I got to stay true and just give you as much data as I can. I'm going to cut this here and there'll probably be another video segment that'll come out tomorrow where we're going to get this assembled. And my goal is to get to probably page, I don't know, somewhere in the thirties. This whole section is going to go quick. This is the band. We're, we're <clears throat> I'll explain. We're going to talk about coaxes and stuff. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the meter placement. But a lot of this is going to start moving really, really quick. I want to get the faceplate completed, the standoff, the relays in, on off switches, that kind of stuff. Probably get down to where I got the tube sockets going on. So that much ground to cover. We're going to break this up into a two or three part series. So on this note, I'm going to run away. Gentlemen, my name is BBI. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue on with this. 
you got any questions, calls, or anything I can do to help fill in the holes for you on this project or about any other amplifier project you got, the odds are pretty high. If you Google it, you'll see my name behind a YouTube video. I've try I'm really trying to keep the, the library, and that's really what I'm creating at this point. I'm trying to keep the library um, growing. God knows I've got a whole room full of stuff here that people have sent me. Um, I'd say a good third of it I've never seen before, and I can't wait to delve my hands into it. So, now note, moving on. I appreciate every single one of you guys, and I mean that from the honest bottom of my heart. I say it at the end of every video, and I know you guys watch a lot of YouTube videos where people, thanks guys, appreciate you bros. That's not me. I'm very humbly and very reverently saying thank you. Because if it wasn't for all of you watching, clicking subscribe, and giving me a thumbs up, we wouldn't be here. I can never, ever forget that. I say thanks. Big shout out to Harbach. Big shout out to Bird and Coaxial Dynamics. I was on the phone with both of them today. And a big shout out to Siglent and Excess Power. Thanks, guys. There'll be more to come tomorrow. Bump up. From the biggest duck in Idaho. Bye-bye.